So thank you very much to everyone for joining our webinar today on centering culture in reinforcing SDG delivery and achieving the goals of the Pact for the Future. This webinar is taking place in the context of the UN's high level political forum, which is currently taking place in New York. Um, and it's an official side event featured on the program. And I think it, the aim that we're looking to achieve here, I think what we're looking to do is really ensure that culture is the ensure that culture that we're looking at those cultural aspects of the delivery of the SDGs, how it's relevant right now. The, uh, the webinar is put together by the Culture 2030 Goal Campaign, which we'll talk a little bit about later, um, which brings but which brings together global and regional representative networks of organisations working to advance and which, which underline the importance of culture as a driver, as a determinant of sustainable development. We're really happy to be joined by a panel of real experts here who will be able to give some really good ideas. I think though the key idea behind this webinar is that I know it's very easy to talk about things and certainly I'm in New York currently there's a lot of people highlighting how their issue will make the difference and, 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 and how their issue will make the difference in achieving sustainable development. I think what we really want to do today is underline firstly a little bit of work around how culture is already being taken into account but I think really importantly paint draw a narrative actually help make it real this idea of what a development model what a model of sustainable development that really integrates culture actually looks like. So in terms of our agenda, how we're going to spend the time today, um, firstly, I'll offer a little bit more background around the Culture 2030 Goal campaign, what it is, what it does, what it looks to do. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, I think, why we think that a culture goal is so important, why that's in our name, why that's one of our primary, that's what really our sort of primary objective in the long term for this work. We'll have a little look back at some emerging research, which we'll hopefully be publishing later this week, around the place of culture in the voluntary national reviews of delivering the SDGs now. And that's a great way of getting a sense of to what extent is culture already being taken into account? To what extent is already being integrated into the way that governments look to deliver on sustainable development? And then I think the most exciting part is understanding what does success look like? And for that, I'm really happy that we're going to be joined by the Joint Secretary at the Ministry of Culture for India, Lily Pandeya, who's done some really heroic work in the context of the G20 and elsewhere in terms of making sure that culture is seen as a goal, that it is integrated. We're joined by Jordi Pasquale, the coordinator of the Gender 21, UCLG's United City and Local Governments Culture Committee. We're joined by Elge Yildirim, who's an artist, an urban planner, a heritage professional based in Tokyo. And by Demolari Oyedele, the founder of Library Aid Africa, who's who comes from Nigeria, but is based in Rwanda at the moment. So the reason why, oh, sorry, I probably have gone a bit too fast there. So to talk a little bit about, camp about the campaign, I think the crucial idea, the thing that underpins why it's there, is the idea that really culture is the missing goal, that it was a mistake. It was an oversight not to include culture in the 2030 agenda when it was agreed back in 2015, because this has had a number of negative, this has a number of negative effects. Or to flip it more positively, by acting as if there is a culture goal, we can actually enhance development, we can make greater policy effectiveness, we can actually really achieve that goal of a comprehensive sustainable development framework. As a campaign, we argue that there are, there are five key areas, five key reasons why we need that culture goal, why that would make a difference, why simply mainstreaming, suggesting that culture is an issue across the board isn't necessarily enough. I think firstly, it is almost a status thing. Having culture up there as a goal will underline that culture policy, culture ministries, culture agencies are a full lever, are really an area where governments should act, where they can act, in order to achieve those goals of sustainable development. It's important in doing that by creating that status, then you open up possibilities for new connections. You make sure that those focusing on other policy areas and other ministries and other agencies see culture as a place where you can make things happen, see culture as a way of enhancing what they're doing. Again, something that isn't necessarily possible unless culture has that vital status. Um, it's an important point for the culture sector itself. It's normal that culture practitioners look at the SDGs, they don't necessarily see themselves reflected in the same way as those working in the agriculture sector, in the health sector, in the education sector may see themselves reflected. At the moment, it looks like it, and it, culture is really obvious by its absence from there. 
And so it's understandable that maybe there isn't this sense of mobilization, this sense of belonging, this sense of ownership, the sense of responsibility for contributing to the sustainable development agenda. We know, we would, I don't know, we certainly argue, and I know that I think Geordie will talk a little bit about this further on, is that that greater focus on culture does have some really positive spillover effects, that taking account of culture allows us to activate other goals. It is a factor in driving the effectiveness of policy interventions, their ability to actually change behaviours, change the way that people act, do, think, in order to achieve goals on sustainable consumption, on health, on well-being, on peace and security. And of course, the culture itself has a fantastic mobilising power, a great way of like, inspiring people to action, to doing things differently. And then linked to that, there's that issue around, also, we are aware that culture, when it's unreformed, when, it, when it's unreformed, when there isn't consideration, can end up being a barrier. But I think much as the Climate Heritage Campaign does, it argues these barriers are human, these barriers are cultural, and the best way of addressing cultural barriers to development and cultural factors that may hinder development is through culture. We do this, therefore, by taking a cultural lens, adopting cultural practices, promoting cultural activities in order to make positive change happen. So this is effectively what the culture campaign, COP2030 campaign, looks to do through promoting a culture goal in the, in, in the post-2030 agenda, but I think really importantly, encouraging countries, local governments, actors at all level, to, levels to act as if there were a cultural goal in place today. In order to support this work, we have, as a campaign, developed a zero draft of a culture goal. And the idea really here is to move beyond simply saying culture, a lot in meetings, and actually put on the table, really you know, set out what we think a culture goal could look like. And I think this has been a really useful exercise because it understand, it underlines really that there's a quite a broad approach to what culture is. It's both an actor and a it's a actor in terms of cultural professionals, the artists, creators, the heritage professionals, decision makers. It's also a factor. It's the understanding of what makes people work and how they think and what determines their behaviours. It's a pillar of sustainable development. It's a goal in itself. So. In the zero draft of the culture goal, which you can find on our website, and I will be showing a link to this later on, we set out a set of 10 potential targets as if a culture goal were to exist today. We set out that the goal itself should focus on cultural sustainability for the well-being of all. This concept of cultural sustainability we do see appearing in a number of national takes on this. And you can see that this includes a range of areas, so areas focusing on culture as goals, so the importance of cultural rights for all, the importance of safeguarding heritage, the importance of cultural diversity, the interests of artists and creators. But there's also that focus on how culture can be a driver, can be an enabler of broader positive outcomes of making a difference, of contributing to wider agendas through promoting that culture of peace, nonviolence and global citizenship, through mobilising heritage to make a difference within communities, through um, enhancing uh, through promoting cross-border exchanges the possibilities for peoples to come together to build understanding to build cohesion there's a specific focus on the importance the needs of indigenous peoples how to help them strengthen their own institutions in order to have that voice there's the application of culture to uh, environmental and urban planning it's such a key factor i know that Ege, of course is an expert in this working in the in, in, in working in that sector and we also have, in line with the, the, the Sustainable Development Goals that already exist, that were agreed back in 2015, enablers, cross-cutting factors. So in particular, that idea of supporting institutions, making sure that institutions such as libraries, which might come from a library organisation, but archives, museums, cultural centres, etc., are able to fulfil their potential, are able to be catalysts, places where things happen. And then more broadly, ensuring that cultural considerations are taken into account across the board. And this leads me quite nicely to um, looking at what is the state, to what extent are countries already acting as if there's a cultural goal? To what extent, using those voluntary national reviews, and I'll say a little bit more about that, can we see that actually countries already are acting as if there is a culture goal in their overall development strategies? Now, voluntary national reviews are a really interesting tool, a really interesting evidence base for work here. They are designed to provide a snapshot of how different authorities at the national level are going about 
performing sustainable development? What do they think count? What are the challenges that they're coming across? Who are the stakeholders that they're mobilizing? And of course, these are national. There are also excellent examples and quite a few local reviews, what well, we subnational reviews, which take the same approach, but at that national or regional level, recognizing, of course, that so much of sustainable development is only achieved through actions taken at that level. Come back to voluntary national reviews. What we've done, and I said we will put out the research on this hopefully later this week, is analyze to what extent are they talking about culture? How are they talking about culture? As we'll see, to what extent are they reflecting on some of those targets that we've set out in our zero drive? And so first positive piece of good news of all the voluntary national reviews that have been published so far, they're not all out, all of them refer to culture. But already a really helpful start. It would be quite depressing if, if one didn't. And you have, I think, a real standout one, which is worth highlighting, is that of Palau in the Pacific, um, which actually really puts culture front and centre. It's the first pillar of their approach to sustainable development. It underlines the importance of harnessing cultural heritage to build back better for a sustainable future. But we see in these that in line with the approach taken by the campaign as a whole, culture is appear, appears in different ways. Culture is tackled in different ways. We see culture highlighted as a basis for identity, for statehood, for the cohesion of communities as a whole, as a real starting point factor when looking at sustainable development. We see countries seeing culture as a pillar of sustainable development, talking explicitly about cultural sustainability, about how we should be thinking about culture in the same breath as we think about economic, social and environmental sustainability. We see countries citing culture as a goal in itself, even beyond the reference to safeguarding cultural and national heritage that already exists in SDG 11.4, there's also a strong focus on the need to support the cultural sector, in particular to support cultural rights, cultural participation. So culture is a goal in itself. It's also very broadly seen as an enabler of progress elsewhere. There's some really great work in the report, in particular from Colombia, from Brazil, from Ecuador, looking at their work to mobilize culture, to take account of culture in order to support work, not least around cons sustainable consumption, around nutrition, around agriculture. There's some really deep thinking that's gone on, some really strong examples around how culture can enable work. And there's also realism about the fact that sometimes unformed cultural barriers, cultural rigidities, can be a barrier, they can be a challenge, and so really highlighting the need for cultural interventions to address them. Culture is also cited as being a means of communicating the SDGs, of mobilising communities, helping people to understand the value of, of the SDGs, why, they're, why it's relevant, why it matters. And then finally, there's quite a lot of consideration as a, a broader set of behaviours. We see a lot of references to cultures of innovation, of transparency, of equality, of human rights. And again, maybe this is a broader definition of culture, but actually given that it refers to behaviours and given the power of culture to affect those behaviours, to encourage people to reflect, I think these references are also really powerful. In terms of how far different countries are looking at these different targets, and I think this is a really interesting metric for us of how comprehensive the culture goal is, um, Brazil takes the prize because I think Brazil in its report, it has very strong focus on culture. It does talk about, it does refer to actions that would deliver on each of the 10 targets that we set out. Other really strong examples, Ecuador, Palau, which of course with culture on the front cover of its report, <clears throat> looking down Colombia, Oman, Solomons, Mauritius, Austria, Costa Rica, Honduras, Laos, PDR, Peru, and Spain. These are, I think you can see that actually a lot of countries are dealing with at least half of the targets down there. And I think a really positive thing that we see from here is that it's a real geographical diversity. You have almost all regions represented in the in these countries that are really looking at culture in a comprehensive and a deep in an interesting way. And, and I think that's important. It's really valuable that culture is not seen as just something for richer countries to put in place, but it's really something that's to be mobilized that has potential that needs to be seen as a policy lever, as a policy instrument by people in all parts of the world. Final little bit of data for you is just looking at the degree to which some of these different targets are represented, are picked up upon in different goals. And so looking across the board, certainly that target three, protected heritage, has the largest single number of countries talking about it. And I don't think that's a surprise 
given that at least in the SDGs, despite a pretty poor coverage of culture in general, there is in goal 11.4 an explicit reference to the importance of safeguarding cultural and natural heritage. And um, I think some really a really positive sign is there is that reference to the importance of integrating culture across the board. I think that's really a key thing that, again, we do see culture as a goal, but we see it as a goal because it also means that we can make those interlinkages, make those connections. Linked to that, obviously, the link to cities and environment, how culture builds stronger communities, more sustainable environments, cultural peace, cultural rights. So we see a really good sort of mix of things, perhaps a little bit less around cultural institutions, cultural mobility. Things vary from year to year. So I think we know that last year, over 50% of SDG, of voluntary national reviews, talked about, for example, the importance of, of libraries uh, as, as places where the sustainable development goals can be achieved. Now, looking forward um, at what might happen in the future, something that we're certainly very excited about, very positive about, is the reference to, the cult to culture in the latest revision of the United Nations Pact for the Future. This is currently under negotiation, and this is going to be the key landmark document that comes out of the Summit of the Future, which will take place around the time of the UN General Assembly this September. And this is really intended to be a, I said, a landmark document, a milestone document, looking at how do we build the capacity of the UN? How do we make sure that the UN is able to realize the potential of multilateralism, the cooperation between all states working together at the global level into the future? There's very much this concern that at the moment multilateralism may be under threat, that more and more countries are willing to do things themselves, that they don't feel bound by the sorts of commitments they make, that the multilateral system itself doesn't have the tools, the institutions, the possibilities to make things happen, to react to crises, to promote more positive change. We certainly argue that one way of improving this ability to get things done is that better integration of culture of bearing in mind both, I said, culture as a goal, as something that matters to people, as something that cannot be ignored if we want to promote sustainable development as a whole, but also as a driver. And so we see this, we see greater interest in the importance of behaviours in shaping what happens um, within the UN. But the most positive thing has been in that latest draft of the pack, a specific action seven focused on protecting and promoting culture as an integral component of sustainable development. It really important in here there's talk about the importance of a standalone goal we need to invest in protecting and promoting culture and and to focus on building up this cross-cultural relations dealing with that issue of restitution really starting with the discussions that need to happen in that space now of course this is a draft and um, this is not the final document so far we absolutely cannot take this for granted um, and so a key challenge that we have is how do we underline how important it is to keep this as it is as a campaign, we have put out a statement, we've shared it with member states, we've shared it with the facilitators, encouraging them to keep this as it is. But certainly we hope that anyone who's interested in culture will activate, will move to make sure that their governments understand the importance of defending and promoting this as a goal. Of course, as I said, this is it's a goal. It talks about something that might happen in the post-2030 agenda in terms of coming up with a coming up with a standalone goal achieving that, that achieving that objective of giving culture the status as a policy area and um, giving culture the status as the policy area that it needs to be taken seriously to be fully mobilized to enable those interlinkages with actions in other policy areas to be realized to mobilize the culture field to build up that sense of responsibility of agency of making things happen to lead to that stronger cultural approach to delivery of policy in different areas which in turn should lead to greater effectiveness greater progress towards the development model that we actually want. So these are all um, words, um, they're all great ideas about what might happen in the future, what will happen when, when we, if we do get a culture goal in a future agenda, if we do get consensus that we should act as if there were a cultural goal in place today. But crucially, I think these are words, this is UN speak. And so what we really wanted to do with this webinar was have that conversation about what does success look like? What, does, what happens when we're able to, what, what, what does it look like? What does a sustainable development framework look like? What does life look like when we have properly integrated culture into our broad development frameworks? And so with that, I'm, I'm happy, very happy to actually hand over to the experts on this point. And so as I said, I'm very happy to welcome four really excellent speakers to our webinar today. 
Um, first of all, um, we have uh, Ms. Lily Pandeya, who is the Joint Secretary at the Ministry of Culture in the Government of India, and she's held this role since 2021. And in this time, as I said, she's played a really heroic role in the context of India's G20 presidency to actually make sure that culture is recognised to really drive not only the cultural agenda as a whole, the value of the G20 as a space to talk about cultural policy, to have it up there as this top ranking policy area, but really to focus on how do we integrate culture into broader development policy. So we have Lily, and I'll quickly introduce the others and then hand over to hand over to you. We also have um, Ege Yildirim, who is a uh, an urban planner and an artist, um, and who has uh, worked in many years in heritage consultancy and management. She's got a very strong focus on cultural heritage policy, uh, policy and advocacy, and is currently the director of Terra Madonna, and so actually putting some of these ideas into practice in a small town in Turkey. And so I think hopefully it's a really positive example of what actually happens when you make culture part of your overall development policy. We have Jordi Pasquale, who is a, a, a geographer, a cultural manager and coordinator of the Culture Commission of Agenda 21, which sits within United Cities and local government, and who is really sitting with the people within local governments, the mayors, the officials, the leads within local government, um, the, within local government, who are actually um, within local government who are thinking about how to make culture a key part of urban development. And then finally, I'm happy to welcome Damalali Oyedele, who is a um, who is the um, the founder of Library Aid Africa, an NGO that's really doing work to maximize the potential of libraries as cultural institutions to contribute to development. And so who can also set out a vision there. So I've just been told that Lily is um, has had to step away for a moment. And so I would like to start with Ege um, in terms of, could you set out your vision of what does a development framework where we actually really make the most of culture look like? Ege, over to you. Um, thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, greetings, everyone. Thanks for being with us this morning in New York, quite early and around the globe also. It's in the, in, in, it's the afternoon uh, in Turkey, in Ankara right now. Um, so um, I'll share some notes uh, from uh, the perspective of my experience and uh, who I represent here. It's mainly the cultural heritage sector, uh, but it's been a hugely rewarding experience uh, to be working with the whole campaign uh, to see the wider framework of how culture can really effectively uh, contribute to sustainable development. And it really is huge. And uh, we keep growing and learning every day. Um, so. Uh, looking at the um, heritage um, angle mainly, um, I'm uh, representing the International Council um, on Monuments and Sites here today. Uh, we're a very proud member of the campaign since 2014. Uh, we are a global network of cultural heritage experts, professionals uh, with uh, representation in more than 100 countries and um, organized in more than 30 thematic international scientific committees. Um, and we have some special working groups uh, in the past decade or so, especially really focusing on the wider aspect of cultural heritage. It's not just a monument or just an archaeological site or a building. It's uh, completely engaged with social economic life uh, is what we find. And um, also the relations with climate action of heritage are very uh, important for us to advance, of course. Um, so, so um, Heritage is uh, quite lucky uh, in the um, SDGs framework because we do actually have a target 11.4, uh, but we have learned that um, we really need to go beyond just this target, um, not only for the current agenda uh, of 2015 to 2030, but also beyond. Um, both um, having a, a bigger uh, goal, a cultural goal, um, plus having the transversal um, integration of cultural concerns across the board, um, as Stephen very rightly emphasized, and these are also on our radar. And actually, I just noticed that from the VNR analysis uh, he just showed us, the top and uh, highest um, emphases um, that the VNRs show, um, one is um, 11, and the other one is integrating cultural generally. So that kind of proves that when you have a specific target or a goal in there officially, then the ratings go up, but people are increasingly aware of how culture is also everywhere. So you cannot box it in only, you have to look at it transversely, plus having its policy castle a fortress to move from, let's say. Um, 
And uh, we um, were, as Stephen said, uh, reviewing the Pact for the Future, its uh, current drafts um, that have been put out, um, the latest one in May. We are very happy and excited about Action 7, of course. It directly um, addresses culture. Uh, there are a couple of more actions that we can um, engage as hooks into this matter. Uh, we realize number 30, for example. Uh, it talks about Action 30. We will build on and complement traditional and local knowledge. Uh, heritage um, is very uh, closely connected with indigenous knowledge, the knowledge and the resources that have been brought to us from the past, and we are entrusted to convey to the future. So this intergenerational justice issue and um, the you know the the future look um, of, of um, culture. Um, there is also action forty eight uh, talking about developing a framework on measures of progress on sustainable development to complement growth from domestic product. So progress is not just GDP. We've been saying this for years now. It's not just a couple of numbers of how richer, how much richer we get. It's about quality of life and culture is difficult to um, quantify, but we are learning. There are ways that we, that we need to, we have to quantify different cultural achievements and benefits and progress and look at how uh, quality progress can actually be visible and have an impact in an actual policy. Um, at ECOMOS, um, the SDGs uh, working group that I'm also part of, uh, we have been uh, advocating um, on the role of heritage uh, for some years now, and um, we've defined heritage with its value for identity and as a repository of historical, cultural, and social memory preserved through its authenticity, integrity, and sense of place, forms a crucial aspect of the development process and has an indispensable role in sustainable development and urbanization. As a fundamental asset of long-term tourism development, strengthening social fabric and enhancing social well-being and enhancing the appeal and creativity of regions. Uh, this definition can be further expanded um, looking at how heritage through enabling cohesion is an agent of peace, how it can bring different kinds of cultural groups together. There is shared heritage, multi-layered heritage that we all are interested to look after together. It's our habitat. Uh, looking at mental well-being issues, we saw that in the COVID-19 pandemic, um, um, heritage uh, became something people missed and clung to for um, a reference point, stability, mental well-being in their lives. Um, education and understanding, of course, uh, looking at our history that with its rights and wrongs and learning from it and lots of discussions um, on the baggage of history and heritage we have. Um, and uh, it's uh, just basically resource conservation. One of our colleagues um, has been widely quoted as saying, the greenest building is the one already built. So conserving existing buildings, historic and older in general, that stock is a huge resource and uh, for embodied carbon and um, for resource efficiency. So uh, we have to look at um, heritage and cultural heritage from this perspective as well. Um, heritage at the UN level is mainly um, focused on the UNESCO World Heritage Convention, of course, but also uh, illicit trafficking of cultural property is a very um, uh, high agenda item. You saw that in the Pact for the Future. Um, it's also a matter of um, multilateral dialogue and peace building. Um, and UNESCO's other conventions um, also um, have a lot of cultural components in them. Um, ECOMOS has been um, putting out resolutions for the past um, few years on the cultural dimensions of the SDGs as well. We have a policy guidance on heritage and development actors engaging um, with the SDGs. Uh, we have vibrant discussions on heritage and gender. Uh, very recently, we are providing feedback and engaging with Mondia Cult. Uh, this is the Global Cultural Conference, Mondia Cult, if you haven't heard of it before. Please watch out for Mondia Cult. Uh, the first one was 40 years ago in Mexico. The second one was 40 years after that in 2022, again in Mexico. And the next year we'll have it in Spain, I believe, in September 2025. The Ministries of uh, Culture um, will bring, uh, come together again. And that really advocates for a, a standalone cultural goal as well, uh, which is great for us. Um, and uh, I've already spoken seven minutes. It's a little too much, I think. But um, I would like to put in a few, a few points on local development if I have time, or should I leave it for the conversation, Stephen? I, I, I think that would be good because obviously it, it, it's at that local level where you're actually making things happen. So okay, a, thank a minute you. on that would be good. All right, thank you. Uh, so um, I was mentioning ECOMOS is a global organization and we do... Um, place importance on this global advocacy, but uh, uh, many of our members, including myself, are local practitioners, and 
uh, having been in the global policy spheres for a while, I have actually seen how important it is to go back the other end of the spectrum to local real action. So I have actually relocated from Istanbul, a major world city, to a very small, uh, hilly Silk Road town in, in Turkey called Mudurnu. Uh, I was a heritage manager there uh, before and uh, coordinating the UNESCO nomination, etc. Now I have a social enterprise really engaging uh, with the local community. We are operating a boutique hotel and trying to engage the local government every day. So th this is the kind of experience that really teaches us, um, us a lot. Um, I've also been um, working with other municipalities uh, around the country and some real lessons. We have structural barriers to overcome um, policy level and um, I think local this is uh, true at the local and national level as well but you can really see it at the local level these structural barrier barriers are mental and financial I would say the mental barrier is culture does not ever become a real policy priority uh, for many mayors and many go and local governments. It's not a luxury or an afterthought. It's an uh, economic engine. It's a booster of the quality of life through tourism and other um, ways. It's a resources conservation and efficiency. But um, explaining this to decision makers, this is a long, thin path, I will say. Yeah, you, um, education and awareness raising through a long process and integrated um, so, society-wide education and awareness raising, civil society activism and mobilization. These are um, absolutely necessary key ingredients. With financing, we need to tap into all kinds of investment opportunities. And um, in terms of financing, there's this whole issue of wealth distribution and the poverty gap we're talking about. If we're going to address the poverty gap this is in, in all levels and culture is underrepresented in financing as well um we need visionary leaders they really make a difference uh understanding the realities of the local ground level and and how you can actually make tangible action happen um you see this at the uh, local level in different contexts but um, the national and higher level policy lead leadership does also affect local policy so we have to work at all levels and the vlrs and vnrs are really a uh, key instruments for this and just to, to close off uh, this long, long intervention, I guess we all need to keep our courage, our optimism, our commitment, our sincere engagement with the communities around us, stay humble, listen to needs and realities of, of um, people and societies around us. Uh, so hopefully uh, we are all on the same page and we do our part. I'm sure all participants have uh, these kinds of efforts. So looking forward to reactions and the conversation um, afterwards. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I think oh, 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 already that's an extreme and it's a fantastically positive vision of, of, of what's possible in terms of a society, a, a world where culture is um, taken on board, where it is integrated as a goal, as one which is more cohesive, which is more peaceful, um, that should be more efficient, more, I don't know, should, should be better adapted to, should, I know, should be causing less damage when it comes to climate change, should be more efficient. Um, I think underlying that's a world where also where there's stronger financing streams coming into culture to support cultural initiatives, where we have more businesses set up which really work with communities that create jobs, that create possibilities. We have leaders who are actually really responsive policies that are really responsive to the pe people's needs and therefore actually allow for that more sort of visionary, transformative approach that I think I know, that stronger taking account of culture actually allows for. So. Fantastic. I think what I'm now going to do is um, share, in fact, we've got a video from Lily Pandea, which is, is fantastic, which we're extremely grateful for. So I'm just going to share that. So we'll get Lily's view and then we'll go on to Jordi and Damilare. So this should be working now. Namaste. Ladies and gentlemen, in the dynamic landscape of sustainable development, culture is not only a repository of our heritage, but also a catalyst for economic resilience, social cohesion, and environmental stewardship. As we embrace the principles of the new economics for sustainable development, we recognize the profound synergy between culture and sustainability. The diverse expressions of culture and creativity play a pivotal role in shaping the identity and ethos of a community, enabling individuals to express themselves and establish meaningful connections. India, with a heritage spanning millennia, understands firsthand the transformative power of culture. It permeates every facet of our society, from our art and literature 
to our rituals and beliefs, shaping our identity and fostering a sense of belonging. Situated at the confluence of creativity, commerce, collaboration and technology, the Culture Working Group under India's G20 Presidency championed the groundbreaking endorsement of culture as a standalone goal in the post-2030 Global Development Agenda as enshrined in the Para 31 of the New Delhi Leaders Declaration 2023. This milestone marks a paradigm shift in the global development strategy as it underscores culture as a fundamental pillar for inclusive and sustainable development, recognizing its impact on social inclusion and economic growth. The culture goal would galvanize global action, nurture creativity and intercultural dialogue, empower marginalized communities and safeguard vulnerable heritage, including traditional cultural knowledge and traditional cultural expressions. Culture so far has been considered only as a transversal necessity for the achievement of 17 Sustainable Development Goals. The insights gained through Culture 2030 Global Campaign emphasizes the necessity of integrating culture through a ground-up approach in national development strategy as well as the local development systems. It highlights that the protection and promotion of cultural heritage contributes significantly to the socio-economic and environmental dimensions of sustainable development. The initiative also stresses the importance of cultural diversity and intercultural dialogue in achieving peace and security, which are integral to the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. By weaving cultural considerations into the core fabric of development, we unlock its transformative potential, ensuring a more equitable, just and sustainable world for generations to come. Looking ahead, the Pact for the Future represents a pivotal moment in our collective journey towards integrating culture into the core of sustainable development strategies. By endorsing Action 7 of the Pact, which emphasizes the protection and promotion of culture as integral to sustainable development, we affirm the power of collective action in fostering global cultural dialogue and cooperation. I am confident that this collaborative dialogue among a diverse range of stakeholders within the culture sector, as exemplified by this session, will lay the groundwork for achieving our goals and shaping the narrative of the UN Summit of the Future for culture-led development in a world beyond 2030. Thank you. Namaste. It's a fantastic intervention from, from, from Lily there, but obviously as, as someone who has and very much championed in a very real sense uh, the place of culture and development and as highlighted that key New Delhi lead G20 leaders declaration last year setting out the importance of a culture goal and I think I don't know the, the case that she sets out is, is is incredibly convincing I think that point about the role of I don't know, a culture-led development strategy as being one that really um, builds that sense of agency, that possibility to act at all levels, at the level of individuals, at the level of communities, that people don't need to be just spectators, bystanders, the, the, the subject or objects of policy, that they can actually mobilise themselves and through that leading to a, 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 a unlocking a transformation, a really sort of transformative approach. And I think Crucially, right at the beginning, she mentioned the importance of a of the new economics of sustainable development and how, in fact, if you don't take account of culture within that, then simply it doesn't exist. You know, there's no there's no possibility of doing it without that full recognition of culture. So, a really strong um, input there, really strong vision of, of of what we could be looking at if we get this right from Lily. So, we're very grateful to Ms. Pandaya for that. Um, I'd now like to hand over to Jordi to offer your perspective. Jordi, over to you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you very much to all. Let me take uh, the conversation from the point that you have just raised. Um, the successes of this campaign are based on the commitment of individuals. And here we had the chance in 2023 
to have the partnership with the government of India, chair uh, of the G20, and the commitment of Lili Pandeya, if that commitment would not have existed, the presence of the wording on culture in the G20 final declaration, the leaders declaration, not just the cultural minister, ministers, but the leaders declaration uh, would not have taken place. So the work of people working as a network, explaining who does what and why is fundamental to the success of this campaign. The campaign was born in 2013. So it's 11 years ago when our first proposal of a culture goal was released in September 2013. And at that moment, we knew it was not going to happen because no other institution, no other network uh, than the members of the campaign, campaign was prepared to support the existence of a culture goal, unfortunately. Now it seems that the, the critical mass exists and we are extremely happy for the work we have developed in the last 11 years. We are very proud and we are ready to have new people on board as we had last year, India. We are totally open to have new people supporting this culture goal ambition. Why? Well, because first, as the results of the survey that we conducted two years ago when we were preparing our second proposal of a culture goal, which the one that we released uh, on the eve of Mondia Cult 2022 in Mexico City, the survey we conducted says that the cultural actors, 90%, 90% say we would have preferred to have a culture goal. The reasons were very clearly explained by Stephen in his initial speech. And 90%, also 90%, they say it is important to have an explicit goal in the post-2030 development agenda. So 90 say it is needed, we have a goal, and 90% says, yes, we want that goal. Um, the campaign has not only produced these two documents with the proposal of a culture goal. Let me say also in an explicit and very sincere way, the work that Ege Yildirim uh, wrote for us in 2019 and in 2021, analyzing the VNRs, the voluntary national reviews, and the VLRs, the voluntary local reviews. A very in-depth exercise analyzing the wording, the policies, the programs that the nations and the local governments have uh, written to provide evidences on the achievement of the SDGs nationally and locally. This is what we are doing now every year. And Stephen just uh, explained uh, the, the work, the campaign with the leadership of IFLA has done in 2022, 2023, and 2024. So we analyze, we advocate, and we promote. Yes, we, we promote uh, that until we do not have a cultural goal, we want nations and cities to involve cultural actors as much as possible in the national and local delivery of the SDGs and to include the cultural dimension as much as possible in the achievement of the SDGs. This is a resume of this interaction between cultural situations, policies, and the delivery of the SDGs was written and analyzed in this exercise, UCLG published in 2023. And here you can see different degrees of green and different degrees of red. And this is why, as you all know, at this stage of the analysis, that there are very positive interactions between cultural policies, programs, and the achievement of the SDGs, positive interactions, 
neutral interactions, but also negative interactions. And the cultural sector must be aware that policies, programs at our end need to be changed too if we are going to be taken as serious allies in the development agenda post-2030. Post-2030 and pre-2030. We need to be very critical to what we we do uh, all over the world. And let me uh, conclude with a mention with the to the indicators. The, Stephen read the list of the 10 possible targets. Um, some people, some cultural actors, but very often non-cultural actors say, ah, but do you have indicators for that? Um, well, the answer is yes. All 10 targets are based on indicators that exist at, in some countries, in some cities. Some of them are quantitative. Some of them of they are qualitative. They already exist. Some of them match to the UNESCO indicators, the suit of indicators of UNESCO, or of UNESCO on culture and development. They exist. And when you relate, you compare, you put those indicators that already exist in the cultural spheres to the to the indicators, some of them quantitative, some of them qualitative, that exist in today's 2030 agenda, they are not that different. There are several targets in the current list of the SDGs, some of the 169 that are qualitative indicators, similar to the ones we can provide. And some of the quantitative indicators that we can provide are also close to some of the indicators that already exist in the uh, in the agenda 20, 2030. Let me finish with the mention to the seven organizations that are in the steering group of the Culture 2030 Goal Campaign. IFLA, the International Federation of Libraries, ICOMOS, the International Council on Monuments and Sites, the International Federation of Coalitions for Cultural Diversity, the most well-known the most networked federation of artists and practitioners of culture, the International Music Council, and I would like to say hello to Celia Fisher, uh, the Secretary General is, is in, 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 the, in the conversation here with us, and then Culture Action Europe and Arterial, uh, two regional organizations, Europe and Africa, with a global agenda, and this is also very, very important, together with the Culture Committee of UCLG. Let me just add, Stephen, if I may, uh, we work closely with members of the G20. We work closely with UNESCO. Nothing can happen in the transformation of the Agenda 2030 unless the United Nations Organization for Science, Culture and Education is closely involved in this advocacy and with an actor which in the last decade has won a prominent role in the global conversation on cultural development. And this is the UN Special Rapporteur on Cultural Rights. Let me add a footnote because uh, in, in, in order to honor the, the title of, the, of this conversation, Stephen, um, we still believe culture needs to be understood as the fourth pillar of sustainable development, not in order of importance. In order of importance, we could agree culture is the first pillar of sustainable development because nothing can be done unless we analyze our values and unless we consider explicitly heritage, creativity, diversity, celebration of life, and transmission of knowledge as, as fundaments of our souls, our human development, and the development of the places in which we live, cities, nations, the whole humanity. Nothing can be done unless the cultural dimension is the first, the fourth, but a dimension to analyze sustainability. Nothing can be transformed, not the agenda of equality can be achieved, not climate change and the climate emergency can be seriously uh, included in, 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 in our uh, plans to survive 
not peace can be neither peace can be achieved unless culture is explicitly in the equation nothing so we believe at least in uclg that this narrative is here to stay it will it can have ups and downs but we are totally convinced that we cannot understand reality unless the cultural dimension is explicit and certainly it is impossible to transform reality unless the cultural dimension is explicit and operational and this is when cultural actors we all need the ambition to have a goal and to intervene in the delivery of all the other goals for the time being and certainly to be a loyal responsible partner in the implementation of the post 2030 development agenda sorry Stephen, i think i was a bit too long thank you thank you you did a number of things that i should have done in the introduction so i'm glad of that in any case but i i, I think that you know just, just just briefly taking out a couple of lessons from that but i think one that was already made by by miss pandaya um earlier is that it's difficult to imagine a sustainable development agenda worthy of the name without culture and so when we try to define what success looks like it's more how can you define any sort of success without culture if if, if we're being serious now um i think other elements of this sort of future that, that that you brought up were firstly that we're in a world where when decisions are being taken when strategies are being put together when they're being implemented we have cultural actors at the table we have the artists the heritage professionals the culture specialist decision makers are involved at all stages of the process um potentially it, it's a world where actually the, the 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 way that culture policy works the way that cultural actors work is different that there is the, this this potentially a, a, a need for a, a different type of commitment uh, an intensification of commitment an intensification of engagement with other actors and um, working other policy areas in order to to make things happen and, and i think it's a really important point and one that we make all the time i know culture is is essential it's not immovable it's not rigid it's not fixed it's something that that can um that can and does move forward and, and needs to it's it's at the heart of you no know, it's not creative you know, it's creative for a reason there's always actually change moving forward but i think it, it, it's also a world where um, as I know, as you said at the beginning, where culture is taken seriously, where there is a, an, an accountability almost for governments in terms of how they are working with culture, where we have metrics, be they quantitative or qualitative, that mean that it's possible to hold governments to account for whether they are actually integrating, mobilising the potential of culture. So um, with that, I'm very happy to hand over to Damilare to give the perspective as, as founder of Library Aid Africa. So Damilare, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Stephen. It's, it's been an interesting insight today listening to Jody, uh, aka Panda Lily. Yeah, my name is Damilari Oyedele. I'm the co chief executive of Library Aid Africa. Also, I serve on the Southern African Commission Committee of IFLA, where I work with IFLAs on global advocacy priorities in Southern Africa. So as we as we dive in further into this conversation, right, I'll be offering an idea of a future where culture, you know, is proper incorporated into development planning and uh, based on you know my experience in the libraries and also as a friend of library aid africa one of the visions here is where the potential of community cultural infrastructure like libraries is fully realized right and, and like over time preserve disseminate knowledge and not just that libraries are uh, as community cultural infrastructure are transforming into community hubs for innovation co-creation which to empower new trend exploring rather uh new trends and innovation for cultural heritage and its preservation that's one of the vision why of course we set up uh library in africa and to further you know break this down uh it is a world where sustainable development is localized where people have access to the tools uh the resources the support they need uh where they are uh, through the infrastructure, the institutions in their own villages, towns, or you know, neighborhood. And also importantly, uh, these infrastructures, which are you know primarily cultural, that to say uh, they are integrated into, built on, and also adaptive to the culture of the communities they serve, right? And this is what you know libraries have a mission to do, uh, to act as gateways 
and on ramp allowing people to access uh use and contribute to information knowledge and creativity so rather than you know trying to set up new agencies new offices new applications for every new initiative right or uh, every new project i think the, the first action of government in my vision is to look at how they can work with and through these cultural infrastructures that are already existing, um, that are already familiar with the communities they serve, uh, that already understand how they think and how they work. And this is not just about efficiency, all right? Although, of course, uh, making use of existing actors helps, right? It's also about effectiveness because it means that new projects and initiatives can be communicated, can be implemented, in ways that account of cultural factors, in ways that do not lead to resistance or opportunities being ignored or simply you know, unknown. For example, uh, efforts to change eating habits require behavioral change, right? Which in turn means uh, a need to understand beliefs and how to change them. This is deeply, this is a deeply cultural issue, best addressed for many true actions at the local level uh, through cultural integration, integrated institutions, you know, like libraries. In my vision, uh, we also make the most of culture as a way to engage communities to think about their issues. Because unlike police station, you know, all unemployment, unemployment offices or other official venue, it is often easier for people to come to culture, cultural centers, uh, such as libraries, which can have less stigma attached to them. So engaging in cultural activities, in particular group and all creative ones can also lead to a new openness to think about other key things, right? And an example to that is that I think a reason why libraries have, have continued over time, uh, while police centers in many countries have, have noticed because libraries, are, you know, they offer this combination of access to culture and other services. And this can also make libraries as cultural institutions into excellent platforms for partnership with, with other actors, with culture acting as you know, the gateway, right? So in my vision, uh, we also enable and encourage libraries alongside other cultural actors to act as partners and pl platforms. Okay, to act as partners and platforms, drawing on the natural attractiveness to communities as cultural venues to make you know connection meaningful connection here and the final part of my vision is one where all this potential as this understanding of the needs of communities as well as of course as a word of knowledge that libraries collectively safeguard uh, for the future is part of the decision making process and decision making as a whole because if we're not taking all this into account when setting strategies and designing plans, then we risk missing opportunities and perhaps also underperforming. Uh, we already see some great, great, amazing, beautiful examples uh, this year of how libraries being part of the SDG Council and the Vienna planning teams in various countries. But in my, in my opinion, uh, this inclusion of cultural actors like libraries right from the country and through this, we don't just maximize the engagement and mobilization of the cultural field, but also put in policies that not only see culture as an end in itself, but also make the most of culture as a driver of all aspects of sustainable development right from the start. As, a, as I do believe, and also as Stephen set out in the introduction, Okay, that this is something that can only be achieved with an explicit cultural goal. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was fantastic and and and, and super clearly set out. And I, I think just summarizing that for the for the um benefit of everyone here, I think I think firstly there's that point that actually I don't know the integration of a culture goal is the confirmation of a localization that we have an approach to policy making, an approach to actually making change happen that meets people 
where they are and, and interesting actually looking through some of this year's voluntary national reviews and I think again particularly the examples of Colombia and Ecuador are really strong here it's all about rather than having centralized policy making coming out of Bogota or Quito or, or whatever it's people going into communities meeting people where they are understanding what's needed using the infrastructures including cultural infrastructures that are in place in order to deliver more effective policies ones that are and Ecuador in particular talks about um, cultural relevance of, of, of policies. And it's, it, it's an extremely strong um, voluntary national view from that, that point of view, for, from that perspective. I think that um, point about the potential that in this world of success, we see um, many more partnerships um, between different actors, between health professionals, education professionals, um, others, and even security, um, people working to promote peace. And cultural institutions, cultural platforms, cultural actors, and that becomes something that's that's normal. We don't have people working in isolation. And then finally, that that point, which I think um, ties in really nicely with um, things that I know all, all speakers so far have said, that this is also a world where when the government at whatever level sits down and looks to plan its agenda for the coming years and, and plan it to put together its national development plan, its local development plan, you have people from the cultural field there, people who understand the potential of artists, of creators to make things happen. You have people who understand and know what are the cultural specificities of a region, of a country that need to be taken into account. So you have the policy making, but in the end is, is much more bi-directional. It's not being imposed on people. So I really like that. That's some, some really good, positive, concrete ideas. So, um, I had a, a couple of questions which I wanted to to ask the group, and, and then we'll, we'll open up for a, a, a few minutes to, to questions. Um, and anyone who would like to ask, please do either use the Q&A function or the chat function to ask these. Um, I suppose I, I'd, I'd be interested, because I think we have talked about this a little bit, a little bit, and Geordie in particular highlighted that the need for cultural policies themselves to, to potentially change in a world where culture is a development goal. Um, I'd be really interested to hear your perspectives on, on a little bit more about what you think a success in achieving a culture goal, success in integrating culture into development planning in general will mean for practitioners, for artists, for creators, for heritage professionals, for others. Um, again? So <clears throat> what you're asking is how we can improve ourselves as the cultural sector. Y yes, what, what, what changes might be necessary to get there, yeah. Yes, sorry, um, I, I understand, okay. Um, it is complex. Um, um, well, I feel like the uh, a lot of the personalities, profiles and uh, working methods in the cultural sector, uh, we um, are, we seem to be more sensitive souls um, and, uh, Sometimes getting out of our comfort zone is challenging, um, but uh, you know there's a whole world um, out there outside of uh, the the daily routines of cultural actors uh, that uh, are perhaps harsher and blunter, um, and they we assume that everybody has the same sensitivities as us, um, but uh, they really don't, and uh, we sometimes we have to start over and be be very humble and novices, and you know uh, really empathize with people who have no um, culture um, on their agenda and you know, find ways to persuade them to empathize with them um, and uh, to live their life a little bit perhaps walk in their shoes and and, and understand how we can actually uh, be a force for them so this walking out of the comfort zone um, is is one thing and that um, the cultural sector um, could do more of I think cultural policies changing I think um, there's a challenge of uh, changing the perception of culture uh, being uh, more elitist. Uh, many people perceive of culture as the opera or, you know, concerts, whereas culture is all material culture, all human life, you know, is made of culture, you know, and um, in the heritage field, um, archaeology, cultural anthropology, uh, they actually uh, look at how humans have lived their lives, how they have developed um, sustainably or not, and, and, and po and make uh, cultural um, analyses out of these. So um, actually culture is everything we do. So looking at culture as something more inclusive and more mundane, let's say perhaps, uh, so completely reframe um, how uh, culture should be um, format, um, framed, I guess. Uh, and thirdly, 
um, perhaps we could say with uh, culture, I mentioned these uh, negative baggages of heritage, for, for example, the um, historic practices that go against human rights conform um, standards today, um, animal rights or environmental concerns, um, and sometimes cultural practices, just because they're cultural and traditional, um, people really condone a lot of um, unethical um, behavior all around the world. Uh, with gender, especially, let's say, and animal rights, for example. On Twitter, Ecomos has been actually trolled by people who were blaming, blaming us for uh, endorsing pigeon torture, for example, you know, uh, so very weird examples. Uh, so um, I think we have to be very open minded um, about these things. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think, yeah, pushing ourselves as cultural workers, and I know, I, know, I think, I think we have those on the call right now in order to as they get out of the comfort zone be ready to engage be ready to be part of coalitions is a, is a really important one geordie geordie oh we can't hear you right now geordie For something with the microphone or your computer. No, still can't hear you. Can you hear me now? No, we can. No, we can. Yep, the thing's down. That's good. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes. Uh, one one of the most important elements in this conversation is that the economic and social rights of all those that are working in the cultural and artistic field are improved and made specific for the specific work that these communities That these communities do and and here the pandemic uh, the, the the one of the elements that the pandemic brought into the conversation was this is a priority if culture and the arts should be included in the culture goal and this is something that in our list of targets, this is in target five and in target six. So it is it is very important for all the members of the campaign and to the hundreds of organizations that are uh, that belong to the steering group members. This is. Uh, a priority uh, for us. I believe this is a priority of the campaign. We believe that UNESCO is listening. We believe that the ILO is listening. Uh, and we are committed to this, to the achievement of this uh, target as soon as it exists. Um, yeah, I think this is, this is enough. Thank you. And I think that, that, that level, no, that, that, that level of commitment there is, as you say, it, it's very clear in the, um, it's very clear in, in, in the goal. And I think as you pointed out at the beginning in particular through, um, you know the membership of the International Music Council, which of course is a huge amount of work around the rights of musicians and and their interests, um, through the membership of the International Federation of Coalitions for Cultural Diversity as well, um, which I know its function is to bring together creators, cultural practitioners who are, are are working on the ground who can talk to that experience and and make sure that's reflected, that's brought in is really important. And of course, I know. I would have said at the end anyway, but can mention now that one key project that we have over the next year is to actually really go out and seek those inputs on 
how can this goal be enhanced further? Obviously, the, the, the zero draft is already based on public input that has been promoted amongst the communities um, represented by the members of the campaign. Um, Damalare, what, what, what would your take be on, on what, I don't know, in particular, I guess, from your experience as a, as a librarian who's you know, a librarian yourself, someone who works with librarians on the ground, um, what do you think that what sort of change might be necessary in the way that, that libraries work? I mean, I, I would love to start from the point of, you know, awareness and recognition uh, among libraries and uh, library professionals to understand the role, uh, the role they play in the cultural ecosystem, uh, not just in Africa, but globally. And uh, while in library school, I was taught less of what is anything cultural in library school. I got to dive into culture myself after being, being a practicing librarian and getting to work in the development ecosystem. And that shows this, this knowledge gap in the ecosystem, uh, in the library ecosystem about librarians understanding the roles of cultural infrastructure and facility to support the community where they serve. And there needs to be, you know, this awareness to work on to improve going forward to educate librarians across the globe about uh, what our roles are in the cultural ecosystem, how we are key stakeholders and partners working with our in-country community level partners to amplify our cultural roles, more importantly, around achieving the SDGs uh, progressively. And that also we dive into you know, capacity development in context of improving capacity of librarians uh, to understand these things, not just that, but also how to engage actively in them, uh, contributing to local issues in the various countries. Because libraries are uh, across board in communities, in schools, in, in, in rural areas. And that each number, that each network of professionals are truly, truly tremendous to see how we collaborate with the equestrian partners uh, in the various countries to amplify culture and also to further engage uh, progressively to, within country partners to see how libraries continue to serve as a cultural infrastructure in the local communities uh, going forward. Thank you so much. Over to you, Steve. Thank you. And, and, and I, well, I said by, partly that, that that's a job for organisations like, like IFLU is building that capacity to actually be actors and, 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 and changing those, those attitudes and that sense that, well, we can actually do something. And um, we have a place, we have a contribution to make to, to, to that broader, to that broader role. Um, and I think that, 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 that's, I think the, the the point is the point is really clearly made, and I think it probably does require a bit of a, a mindset change. And I think that that builds on what Ege was saying as well. That in addition to the practical skills and and, and making sure we're delivering on all those promises about being responsive, being attentive to the needs of communities that we're actually doing that, but that sense of agency, I think, is a really important one. And of course, that's one of the reasons what why we make the case for a culture goal. So, and. Um, the next question I, I had down, um, I'm just looking to see if there are other questions coming up, but the next question I had down is, I don't know, hypothetically, we achieve a, a culture goal that that, um, that that heads of state and government sit down in September 2020, not September, and sit down in, sept, in September 2030 and agree on what the next 15 year agenda is and the culture goal is up there. W what do you think is the, the first thing that we need to do to make sure that we don't end up in the situation we arguably are in with the SDGs right now, where we are over halfway through and panicking about our ability to actually achieve things. Um, Ege? I, I think a very serious uh, mobilization on reporting and data collection, and that will be the next step. Um, target 11.4, for example, um, it's um, the indicator it has 11.3 um well, sorry 4.1 I, I forget the it's it's um, uh, its indicator was quite, um very widely criticized um and it, it's quite narrow um and uh, it's tier three it's not tier two or one which are stronger indicators so having strong indicators with uh, champions and constituencies that um, do a lot of work uh, ga gathering data and presenting and collating and sharing the data that kind of reporting um i think will be quite important thanks you're muted well, i had a little message on the screen telling you that um so um and uh, yeah i think that, that's a really key point i think we also see that there's not a huge amount of reporting on that indicator anyway i think only nine of the 33 voluntary national reviews published talk about indicators in any sense only five talk about that cultural heritage indicator so it suggests that that's just not really being used so far and whether it's a lack of data a lack of interest a lack of relevance but yes I mean, that comes on to that accountability point um Jordi 
I believe that uh, I I believe this the question is relevant, but if I may, Stephen, uh, I believe that in order for the culture goal to exist, we still need huge efforts. Uh, and we need the conversations with other key stakeholders, key actors in the delivery of a development agenda to understand that we have to have a seat at the table, which we have not. And we will not have that seat at the table if those agree us to have a seat at the table. And here, let me be explicit, if the environmental circles, the feminist movement, or the fighters for equality do not feel are not convinced that what we are advocating for, that the culture goal will be useful for artists and cultural workers and heritage workers and people employed by libraries and all those that work with creativity and heritage and diversity, unless they understand that our goal is also contributing to their goal unless they fight for the goal as we are fighting for our goal and for the other goals, well, it will not happen. So I think that in the next months, in the preparation of Mundia Cult 2025, in the drafting of our next culture goal document, if I may announce or insist on that, Stephen and Ege and Damilare and Celia, we, the Culture 2030 Goal campaign is, is working to have a, a, a more in-depth culture goal document with a, a, an exhaustive analysis of indicators and with a roadmap uh, because this is our commitment to artists and cultural workers and heritage workers and people employed by libraries and the circles that work for culture and the arts in cities and local governments all over the world. Well, uh, we have this commitment and we hope that in the next months, uh, yeah, we will deliver that, that strong document uh, again to serve the global conversation um, with all the bridges and all the alliances with those important stakeholders because their agenda is also ours and we need our agenda, if I may, with our, with Guilleme, our agenda needs also to be theirs. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I think you, you've almost asked a qu answered the questions I, I hadn't asked yet, but I will get to shortly. But I think, no, I suppose just extrapolating from that and I will come back to the, the other question I, I had down which will, will focus on what is holding us back right now but I, I suppose in almost that that first thing is and if, if we get a culture goal it will be because there are strong links between different sectors and so one of the first things to do is actually bring together to have those conversations about practically how do we make sure that these potent this potential for interlinkages is highlighted from the start that people don't suddenly discover the interlinkages that might exist after the event. So, but I will come back to that question about barriers. Um, Damilare, what, 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 I don't know, what do you think the, the the first thing we would need to do if we were successful in, in getting a culture goal would be? I mean, I mean, to, to start with, uh, clearly, that there's no future without culture, right? And 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 that needs us to to explore. A more collaborative way when we actually the culture goal uh to to create awareness about the culture goal itself uh if we're not informed about this how do we engage our stakeholders uh to drive progress going forward 
So the needs for us like create a massive awareness about the cultural goal itself. And also, you know, the roles each stakeholders play to achieve this is so very important. Uh, what are the roles of the libraries, the roles of, of various ecosystem partners, the, the artists, and also how do we also actively engage the community uh, as advocates and champions of this cultural goal? As some of the point is I see we 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 had to start doing as soon as it's achieved. So that we build a very strong community of people, of stakeholders and partners who are informed about these things, who are willing to engage proactively on this. And not just engage, you know, aligns towards tangible activities uh, in country, in the local community to drive progress forward because there's no future without culture. Thank you. Thank you. And, and uh, that that is super practical points, I think, about actually deliberately and mobilizing <laughs> if we if we spent the next few years annoying people about why there needs to be a culture goal we must we need to be able to show that the sector is able to deliver to come up with plans to come up with ways of doing it and I think that that point about communication is is really important and I, I know from some of the discussions in in New York it's still difficult to convince people of why the SDGs are relevant where they actually add value um and I think in particular to um and, and you know, to explain what why there is also a responsibility of doing things, of course, cultural tools can help us get there. Um, so the final question I had, um, and I'll take a look and see something's happened in the in in, in the Q and A perhaps. Um, but given that Geordie already touched on this one, is I don't know that point about what is holding us back right now. I don't know it, it, it's I don't know, only half ironically, there seems to be a culture of undervaluing culture um in the way that policymakers work at the moment and the way that the un works um how do we overcome this unreformed bit of culture this culture of undervaluing culture um Ege. how do we address the culture of undervaluing culture yes <laughs> and and in, in order to get to the goal <laughs> I don't know if I have an answer for that, really. Um, but um, it seems there have been many setbacks um, of of the culture um, uh, sector. Uh, we um, are we don't have as much ex um, of a background, a history as many other sectors in the in sustainable development. I think we're relatively new, which means uh, you know we need to do catch up, which means we um, have to work hard and. Uh, working hard in terms of um, finding those partners that Jordi mentioned and um, the key uh, decision um, influencers, you know, who will be our allies um, in, in the key platforms, the key agendas, the meetings, the declarations, the um, councils. Um, there need, but I think uh, there is an accelerating path. Uh, we have come a long way in the last decade, it seems. So uh, I guess we just need to hang on tight um, and um, also, explore uh, new techniques. Uh, use uh, communication was mentioned. Um, com communication and social media and digital technology. You know, um, these are very powerful tools today. So um, you know we use it very wisely. Um, I would say. Um, and uh, well, one last thing. I, I guess again, um, really um, understanding the counterpart, maybe the enemy, if you, or or your you know your protagonist, if you will, understanding their um, mindset very well. And so a big em empathy and psychology uh, games here. You know, how do you persuade, um, you know, stakeholders who come from a very different place? So um, maybe we can learn from other um, um, other disciplines, maybe uh, like uh, business management or um, sales um, <laughs> um, or not, not conventionally culture related sectors and work, um, you know, real estate, for example, you know, uh, I think we need to um, get, get ourselves very diverse and new uh, partners uh, in, in this process and, and also make them feel that they are a natural partner in this, like it's their cause as well, you know, so. Sorry, I, I'm not very uh, more, more more coherent than this, but it, it is a difficult question, I think. No, no but uh, I think just pr pragmatically, it's an important one. It's understanding the resistances, and, and obviously, some of the time it may just be we don't want to do anything new, um, w w which is I know, a little depressing as a as a, a as an argument. But I think I know we've underlined so many times on on, on this call that 
it's hard to imagine, I don't know, a, a future sustainable development agenda that doesn't involve culture, isn't worth the name. Um, I don't know, it's not an option. I don't know, it, it, it's the mistake would be not to include it. So thank you. Um, Jordi, I don't know, you, you obviously mentioned the importance of, of working with other stakeholder groups and making sure that other stakeholder groups understand why a culture goal is in their interests and, and, and of course, the work within the culture sector as a whole to to make sure that we're conscious of our responsibility to help these other stakeholder groups uh, deliver on their goals. Is there anything you would add? No. Okay, that was easy. <laughs> no, but but I think that there is a question from Lisa Kibutu in the questions and answers, Stephen, I, I do not know if you wanted to... If, 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 if you want to answer that one, that's fine. I've, I've, I've noticed it, but if you can answer it, that would be... Well, I, I would say that the goal setting and delivery, first, the goal setting is open. So as we did in 2022, from end of February, our initial webinar to the survey we conducted in June 2022, and then the, the drafting of the final document in July, August, September, we will be in close touch with all those that wish to help support, uh, critically analyze, uh, constructively contribute to the setting of that uh, goal proposal. Uh, absolutely, it cannot be otherwise. The founding nature of this campaign is that one. Um, delivery, inshallah, inshallah. If there is an art, uh, a culture goal, then yeah, okay. But this is post twenty thirty. When, not if. <laughs> Let's believe it. That's yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Th thanks for answering that one. That that, that uh, I appreciate that and can only echo that that this this process needs to be needs to be open, needs to allow inputs to, to make sense from across the board sort of culture field as a whole. Damalare. Yeah, I mean, I'm a very huge fan of uh, of uh, education. Uh, we need to work, improve on cultural education and also mobilization of the community, our community of artists, uh, community of librarians, community of all key stakeholders in this ecosystem uh, to be informed about what, what roles we need to play going forward. And uh, this massive awareness, of course, needs to lead on to how do we drive local actions in our local communities that will contribute to global impact. Right. And also earlier, Ege mentioned about data. Now we're collecting this data uh, from various regions to, to, to inform the decision and engage key stakeholders to understand you know, the essential roles of culture uh, to achieve the global goals and also post uh, uh, 2030 agenda. So I, I believe this, this has been an interesting conversation where uh, the point is leads to, you know, actionable steps need to take in terms of mobilizing communities, in terms of awareness, in terms of educating our people about what roles we all play in this ecosystem, and also more importantly, uh, data to back these decisions, data to convince policymakers, uh, data to show key evidence being made, uh, being made in, in various local communities as far as cultural intersection uh, with the key partners in country uh, alliance. What to you, Stephen. Thank you so much. I, I think that I know all, all, all the points you make there are absolutely, I know, absolutely right. They just need to keep on strengthening that case. We need to keep on mobilizing. We keep need to keep on demonstrating that I know, we're serious about this. We can work with partners that we're not just, I know, we are about supporting a better world as is the 2030 agenda as a whole. So um, we're running slightly over time. So I'm going to draw things to a close. Um, I would very much encourage people, please do take a look at the campaign website. There's a URL and there's the um, this URL and there's a, uh, a QR code on the screen right now. And um, in particular, you'll see the, the latest inputs that we've been making around the Pact for the Future. And in shortly, hopefully you will see out there the um, our review of the place of culture in a broad sense, so arts, culture, heritage within um, the voluntary national reviews, both as an understanding of where we are now, but also an indication of where we can go. And obviously there are some very positive next steps in there. Stephen. Um, yes. The QR is not visible to all. There That's is fine. A... Oh, it's not visible? No, there is a, a, a square, a rectangle. Oh, okay. Hiding a portion of the QR. That is odd. I'm going to reshare my screen then. 
think that's probably that that's the problem. Is that better? No, it's worse. Okay, so I'm going to stop showing my screen because obviously Zoom is not cooperating with me today. Um, and I will rather actually, I'm just going to type the, the, the link for the website into the chat. Um, yes. But yeah. Um, what we will do is we will uh, provide access to um, this, we'll provide access to a recording of this webinar um, on the website. And as I said, hopefully shortly, you will also see our review of the 2024 Voluntary National Reviews. Um, please do bookmark the website and look at our supporters page, sign up. Um, we'll be communicating more about opportunities to feed in on the development of the next version of the, the, the Culture Goal draft. Um, and otherwise, we're three minutes over. I just want to thank... Um, Ms. Bandea for her participation, fantastic. I want to thank Ege, Jordi, and Dan Malawi for a really great conversation. And I wish everyone a really good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Thank you, Stephen.